fires, etc. But most are personal, which take various forms, sometimes family illness, a death, uh, unfortunately, as we heard this morning, a divorce in the family, other family problems, financial problems. But in all cases, people place their trust in something or someone. But as children of God, who do we place our trust in to resolve any particular crisis? And it's vital to know who you can trust and who's really on your side. Personally, whenever I've encountered a crisis, I've trusted God, except when I didn't trust God. But the thing I've come to conclude, that apart from everything else, I must uh, not just rely on my own resources, my own abilities, my own wisdom, which sometimes uh, when I've been in a crisis and used these self-reliant self skills, the outcome's been okay, and other times not exactly to my liking. But I'm having to learn that regardless of the crisis, one thing above anything else is we must hold on to the Word of God and stand firm in the faith. And it's only when I change my behavior that I can bring about different results that can enhance my personal growth. And as a Christian and likewise as a church, then we can affect the whole society. This morning I want to look at the idea of who we trust in a crisis. In doing so, we will briefly look at two case studies in Isaiah. One's about King Ahaz and the other's King Hezekiah. It's probably, not, it's probably familiar to you. In both cases, Ahaz and Hezekiah were tested by God using similar circumstances and situations to see what they would do in a crisis and to whom they would put their trust. In their book of how to read the Bible for all it's worth, Fee and Stuart believed that the prophets, like Isaiah, were covenant enforcers. That is, that they reminded the people of God's, about God's law, and if they kept it, there was blessings, and if they didn't, punishment would ensure. And it's common in Isaiah for punishment and threat, uh, sorry, promise and threat to run side by side. So in the next couple of minutes, I want to remind us of the purpose of prophecy in Isaiah so we can set the message in its own context and, and see if it has any significance for us today, and I think it does. The purpose of prophecy are best explained in an illustration I got from David Jackman, who's a wonderful theologian and I really like. It's an illustration about a large church where after a sermon, uh, people are gathering outside drinking tea and coffee and generally having a conversation on a pathway, but as more and more people come out, a person steps backwards onto the road, and the person he's talking to sees the car coming and says, you need to get off the road or you'll be knocked down. In effect, that was a prophetic message. If you don't get off the road, you're going to get knocked down. And this is the function of prophecy. There's a warning about a present situation that will lead to a future catastrophe where unless action is taken in the present, you can't remedy the future. There's a car coming, you'll be knocked down. Now, if the prophet's message is heeded and the person comes off the road onto the pavement, they won't get knocked down, they'll be rescued. And we don't turn around to the prophet at that point and say, well, it's a false prophecy, we're gonna stone you. Now, the whole point of the message from the prophet is designed to achieve a change in behavior in the present, so that the future is different. In that sense, the prophecy has been successful. If on the other hand, the person rejects the message and is knocked down, the prophet would not go around and say, what a great prophet I am, I got that right. No, he would in fact be more on the fact that people hadn't listened to his message. So as we look at Isaiah, we will see this is exactly what Isaiah is doing. He's warning people like Ahaz and Hezekiah of what is to come in the present. So they have the opportunity to change their behavior in the present and so bring about a change to their future outcomes. Now in this particular situation with Ahaz and Hezekiah, the events historically took place in the second half of the eighth century. The Assyrian Empire was the strongest power in the world. Egypt was a fading empire. The Babylonian Empire was on the rise and Israel and Judah had 
you know, some good kings who walked in the ways of the Lord and some bad kings who didn't. Now, if you go to your cha uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 1, we will see this, where the crisis, and we're going to deal with Ahaz first, where the crisis that King Ahaz has to deal with and the attempts Isaiah makes to influence his behavior with the intent to get an acceptable outcome and avoid a catastrophe. Verse 1, it says, During the reign of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, king Rezin of Syria, and king Pekah of Ramallah of Israel, marched up to Jerusalem to do battle, but they were unable to prevail against it. Here we see the kings of Syria and Israel making an alliance with the intent of doing battle with Ahaz in Jerusalem and with the intention of bringing David's dynasty to an end. And that will be confirmed when we look at verse 6. However, they did not prevail against it. It's also interesting at this point to realize that Israel and Judah are actually now fighting amongst themselves. They, you know, the two parts of Israel are fighting together against each other. In verse 2, it's reported to the family of David. Now, this is the only place in Isaiah where David's dynasty is personified in the current king. It's, never, it's nowhere else. Uh, but King Ahaz would pr prove to be so far different from David. It's not funny. To continue the verse, Syria is allied with Ephraim, and Ephraim is another name for Israel. And they, that's Ahaz, and his people were emotionally shaken just as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Ahaz knows the northern alliance is more powerful than Judah, at least numerically, and they may even be able to take the gates of Jerusalem. And we know from 2 Chronicles chapter 28, the northern alliance had already killed and captured about 320,000 warriors from Judah. And so now they're standing at the gate. Now this is the crisis that Ahaz has. What's he going to do? How is he going to, who's he going to trust? And the Lord, if you can t look at it, from verse 3, says to a gives advice to Isaiah, to give advice to Ahaz, to go out to eat with your son, Shear Jezab, and meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit on the upper pool that is located on the road to the, to the field where they, don't, where they wash and dry cloth. Tell him, make sure you stay calm. Don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated by these two stubs of smoking logs. In other words, God thinks these two characters are really weak, weak people in themselves. Or by the rage and anger of Rezin of Syria and the son of Ramallah. Syria has plotted with Ephraim, the son of Ramallah, to bring your demise, bring about your demise. They say, let's attack Judah, terrorize it, conquer it. Then they will set up the son of Jabil as its king. The son of Tabil, no one actually quite knows who he is. Uh, the historians have looked and there's no evidence to tell us anything about him. And for this reason, the Lord says, and that the reason is they're trying to bring an end to David's dynasty, of which God has an interest in, it will not take place and it will not happen. That's the word of the Lord to Ahaz. For the leader of Damascus, the leader, for Syria's leader is Damascus, and the leader of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will no longer exist as a nation. In other words, they'll be in exile. In verse 9, Ephraim's leader is Samaria, and Samaria's leader is the son of Ramallah. Uh, again, and then, if you do not stand in the, firm in the faith, you will not stand at all, or another, some versions say you will not stand secure. Uh, that part of the verse, I believe, is the key verse uh, to the, the book of Isaiah, and just about every aspect that Isaiah talks about. Now, this is the crisis that Ahaz and the people of Judah see coming against them. What are they to do? Who are they going to trust? God has just told them to be calm and not afraid. It will not take place, he promises them. God will rescue you. Will you take God's word or stand on and stand on it, or are you going to rely on another form of security? Ahaz has a choice. He can either make a political alliance or he can accept God's offer of protection. In verse 10, God says to, it spoke to Ahaz, in verse 11, ask a confirmation sign from the Lord your God. You can even ask for something miraculous. Isaiah is appealing to Ahaz to act as a believer here. The Lord your God, he says. The Lord your God. 
to stand firm on the word of the Lord. The magnitude of the offer really does show the seriousness of the crisis. And it also shows the assurance that God will give to those who exercise faith. In verse 12, all, like all pagans, Ahaz rejects God's assurance by demonstrating a false face of piety. I will not put the Lord to a test, he says. Well, what happens is that Ahaz will abandon God's promise of salvation for collective security. And he hopes to find an alliance with the king of Assyria. Now, I'm going to jump to 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 7. And Ahaz says this amazing thing. He sends his messengers to, Tiglith, to King Tiglath Pilsa, or Higgy Poo to his friends, of the saying, I am your servant and your dependent. March, march up and rescue me. Can you believe this? I am your servant and your dependent. March up and rescue me. God's just told him he would. He'd do all that. But he's rejected God, and this is what he's now asking a pagan leader. Rescue me from the power of the king of Syria and the king of Israel who have attacked me. Then Ahaz took the silver and the gold that were in the Lord's temple and the treasuries in the royal palace and set it up as a tribute to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria, he responds favorably, as he would, to his request, attacks Damascus and captures it. And it's really amazing that Ahaz, to be honest, has put his faith in a pagan leader rather than God. Ahaz and Judah will pay an incredibly high price for the decision because in verses 10 to 18 of 2 Kings 16, Ahaz will prove he's not a good king. He doesn't walk in the ways of the God. He adopts the, pag Asian, uh, the Assyrian pagan beliefs that become rife right across the land, which is really bad news for Israel. And we can also note that Ahaz sets aside the things of God and makes idols of Baal and leads the people in the world of pagan worship. During his rule, Ahaz has now brought Judith to a deceptive do-it-yourself salvation, which would bring God's judgment on him, and both in shame and humiliation that came with it. If we go back to Isaiah 7.13, Isaiah now tells Ahaz, and it's from the verse, Ahaz, you're also trying the patience of my God. Now with the change of language that we found in verse 10 from your God to my God in verse 13, Isaiah is no longer trying to persuade Ahaz to stand firm in the faith, but is confirming God's displeasure and the judgment is coming. In verse 17 of chapter 7, the judgment is coming and it will be coming because God is going to bring it through the king of Assyria. And that's what Ahaz thought was the way of his salvation, the alliance with Syria. God is now going to use for his destruction. In verses 18 to 25, the Isaiah's prophecy is realized. Assyria will be God's rod of anger used against Ahaz in judgment. Ahaz, his rejection of Isaiah's prophecy and his refusal to change his behavior has brought about judgment and a catastrophe on the nation and on Judah and the, and the city of Jerusalem. If you go back to the illustration, Ahaz has decided to stay on the road and he's just been splattered by the car. In the second case, it will be around Hezekiah, where we'll see a contrasting response in a very, very similar situation. In 2 Kings 18, we see the historical background of Hezekiah. He became a sole ruling king of Judah for 29 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He would see religious be seen as a religious reforming king by removing all traces of the re religions that Ahaz had put in place. And then he purified the temple and brought the people back to observing the Passover. However, and though he had a degree of independence, Ahaz came to the throne and was still a vassal to the empire of Assyria. But with Babylon on the rise and becoming a threat to Assyria, in its dominance of the world, Hezekiah seen a moment of opportunity. I can get out of this situation and with the right alliance he could break away from the yoke of Assyria. And for Hezekiah, his hope was going to be in Egypt, who at the time was a fading power in the region. 
But he might have just, but it might have just been the alliance he needed to get the freedom he desired. But right from the start, God makes it clear that Egypt will prove unreliable. Hezekiah is seeking safety in a place where there is no safety. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1 to 3, God makes the obvious comments about Isaiah's, Hezekiah's decision to go with Egypt. The rebellious children are as good as dead, says the Lord. Those who make plans without consulting me, who form alliances without consulting my spirit, and thereby compound their sin. They travel down to Egypt without seeking my will, seeking Pharaoh's protection, looking for safety in Egypt's protective shade. But Pharaoh's protection will bring you nothing but shame, and safety of Egypt's protective shade is nothing but humiliation. This was Isaiah's word from the Lord warning Hezekiah not to put his trust in Egypt. This will only bring him shame and humiliation. Isaiah makes it clear these are not God's plans. He has not consulted God. God's not in his purview. And in fact, he's just completely disregarded God. In reality, Hezekiah is seeking protection from an alliance other than God. He would find absolutely no protection at all. Well, the end result of that, Isaiah continues to show that Egypt will prove to be unreliable is in verse 7. Chapter 30, verse 7. Egypt is totally incapable of helping. Therefore, I call Rahab to do nothing. Rahab is a word that's often used to describe Egypt. And they're totally, and he calls a Rahab to do nothing, which is a reference that actually Egypt is just all talk and no action. In verse 15 of the same chapter, God goes on to say, For this is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, is saying. If you repented and patiently waited for me, you would have been delivered. If you calmly trusted in me, you would find strength, but you're unwilling. These are very similar words that we read about what God is telling Ahaz. Be calm, don't be afraid. I will rescue you. So Hezekiah, Isaiah is asking Hezekiah to repent from his Egyptian alliance, to trust the Lord, because he will rescue you. Hezekiah appears to be unwilling to break their reliance with Egypt. And in reality, Hezekiah trusts God, except when he doesn't. And now that Hezekiah is satisfied that his military back, he has military backing from Egypt, he's decided he's going to be independent and he's not going to pay any more money to Assyria. They can all go and do their own thing as far as he's concerned. Unfortunately, there's consequences to his actions. In chapter 36, verse 1, in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, King Sennacherib of Assyria marched up to all, against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Hezekiah's actions are met with an invasion by Judah, of Judah by the Assyrian led, Assyria led by Sennacherib. Like Ahaz, who failed, an Assyrian invasion is now another crisis for a Davidic king. Who will he put his trust in? Will he put his trust in the Lord or will he continue to trust in his political alliance with Egypt? That's the question here. In verse 2, the king of Assyria sent his chief advisor from Lachish to King Hezekiah in Jerusalem along with a very large army. The chief advisor stood at the conduit of the upper pool that is located on the road where they wash and dry cloth. Sennacherib's chief advisor stood at the conduct, conduct conduit, I should say, sorry, of the upper pool and to challenge Hezekiah and the people of Judah. This is the same place that Isaiah actually went and met Ahaz back in verse 3 in chapter 7 to ask him to change his behavior and trust the Lord, of which we know he didn't. In verse 4 of chapter 36, just as Ahaz was told to stand firm in the faith, or you will not stand at all, so Hezekiah is asked, and what is your source of confidence? The amazing thing about this, this is a pagan commander who's actually asking him, not Isaiah. Who are you putting your trust in? The irony is this is the same question that God's been asking Ahaz as well. Who are you going to put your trust in? Are you going to trust your alliances or are you going to trust me? Verse 6, the chief advisor makes a point I know you're, going to, you're looking to trust Egypt. That's what he's saying here. But the fact is that Egypt can't help them. 
because Egypt's just been defeated by King Sennacherib at Elkai. In verse 7, the chief advisor, who is an unbeliever in the Lord, is equally confident that any trust or dependence in Yahweh was equally useless and starts to demean the Lord. Perhaps you will tell me that we, you are trusting in the Lord your God. In fact, your God won't be pleased with Hezekiah, who is the one who eliminated, he's the one who eliminated the high places and the altars and told the people of Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship at this altar. The problem was that God actually was pleased with Hezekiah's actions. And I find it funny that pagans always seem to believe that they can interpret and quote the Bible better than Christians. My son Alex walked out the door one day and he said, you know, the Bible says this, blah, 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 whatever it was. I said, oh yeah, whereabouts is that? He said, well, it should be in the Bible. The other thing I've learned in life about the Bible is don't challenge my mother-in-law. She brings up these points and says, this and this is in the Bible. And I say, seriously? Where's that? And she tells me. Yeah. <laughs> Good defense. Do not upset your mother-in-law. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. I want that on tape. <laughs> In verse 10, the Lord himself told me, march up against this land and destroy it. The statement shows that Chief of Isaac has got absolutely no idea or understanding of who Judah's religion is and who their God is. But he felt confident that Judah's God could not overcome them. The supreme insult is seen in Isaiah chapter 36, verse 18. Hezekiah is misleading you when he says, the Lord will rescue us. Have any of the gods of the nations rescued their lands from the power of a king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharam? Indeed, did any of the gods res rescue Samaria from my power? In verse 20 is the killer. Part B. So how can the Lord rescue Jerusalem from my hand? The confrontation of a pagan power against the name and reputation of the Lord. This is the world's most powerful country arrogantly challenging God to rescue Jerusalem from, him, from the crushing siege that they're under. The arrogance of the chief advisor was to believe that Yahweh was no different than the other nation's gods. So now what does Hezekiah do? Does he capitulate? Does he bow the knee? No, he's learnt. He's now going to go to God. In verse four, 1 to 4 of chapter 37, in summary, Hezekiah realizes the folly of his alliance with Egypt and goes to Isaiah and asks him to go to God on his behalf. In verses 5 to 7, Isaiah assures Hezekiah that he will not tolerate Assyria's mocking him. And in fact, God would cut him down with a sword in his own land which is ultimately what happens. But we have a wonderful picture of what Isaiah is now doing when he comes to the Lord. Hezekiah, I should say, sorry. He's taken a letter from his messengers and he's read it. And then he goes up to the temple of the Lord and spreads it out before the Lord. Verse 15, he prayed before the Lord. O Lord, heaven of, our, of heaven's armies, O God of Israel, who's enthroned on the cherubim? You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. Hezekiah has complete trust that God can rescue Judah from the present and presents the whole matter to him in prayer. And although he wants deliverance in prayer, he also reveals that Hezekiah's concern is for the vindication and honor of God's name because the Assyrian chief advisor has been slandering God from verse four right through to here. In verse 18, Hezekiah continues, It's true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all the nations in their lands. Now in verse 20 he prays, Now, O Lord, our God, rescue us from this power, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are the Lord. And that's exactly what happens. I would point out here a couple of facts. In Scripture, two things are causally connected that action must and do take place. In verse 21, God has used the, the phrase, because you have prayed. 
That's what we've got to do because you have prayed. In verse 22, then God replies. This is what God says. Faith comes first, then the deed. The Lord acknowledges Ezekiah's prayer and then tells him what he's about to do. Verse 28 and 29 of the chapter, the Lord rebukes the arrogance of Sennacherib and promises his imminent downfall. As always in Isaiah, there's a word from the Lord before the action. God gives his word, then proves the truth of it by doing it, something that Ahaz had failed to realize. Now we see the Lord's judgment on Assyria. He's replying to Ahaz, Hezekiah's prayer. It's devastating in its simplicity and it's jaw-dropping in its effect. Verse 36, the angel of the Lord went out and killed 185,000 troops in the Assyrian camp. I love this part. And when they all got up in the next morning, they discovered they were all dead. I'm trying to work that out. So Sennacherib of Assyria broke camp and went on his way. He went home and stayed in Nineveh. Reality is, having announced his plans, God acted. This would be the end of the Assyrian war machine and of its arrogant leader, Sennacherib. The Lord demonstrated his faithfulness to Hezekiah's faith in God. And in this case, we saw how in changing his behavior, Hezekiah and his people were rescued by God, avoiding the coming catastrophe. Isaiah is the prophet who reveals that God justifies those who come to him in faith. Unlike Ahaz who stayed on the road and got splattered, Hezekiah stepped back onto the pavement and avoided the catastrophe. Uh, Sennacherib, well, he was killed by his own family, in verse 38, while he's worshipping his God who had no capacity to save him. And unlike God who could save his, own, his people. So, um, and there's a 20 year gap between verse 37 and 38, but the writer hasn't put that in there because he wants to make the comparison about God saving his people and Sennacherib's God couldn't save him, even from his own family. So we've seen Ahaz and Hezekiah, and what do we do in a crisis? In a time of crisis, who do we put our trust in? God or men? Will we be counted amongst the faithful or the faithless? Will we remain faithful to God? The question is one we all have to answer. And the whole intent of my message was to highlight the contrast between save, salvation by faith, that's trusting in God, and do-it-yourself salvation. The difference here is between what God can accomplish and what the world can only offer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of all the earth, that you are the God of all creation. That, Lord, that you are good with your promise. If we stand on the faith, you will save us. But it's also true, Lord, if we do not stand firm in the faith, we will not be secure. I pray, Lord, that in our lives, we will consider you first in all things, with large and small. We pray for your name to be glorified, Lord, in the lives of people, in the lives of this church, and ask, Lord, that your grace will continue throughout our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.